my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Amazing, man. So I've been very familiar with your work for a long time. We've had numerous, numerous requests to have you on the show. Uh, oh, we've, really? We've, cool. We finally delivered. <laughs> you <laughs> <are so laughs> yeah. me. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to start with is obviously in the field of holistic health, you uh-huh. are one of the, you know, one of the sort of pioneers, one of the sort of experts. Mm. So when I was looking at your background, what I find amazing is that considering where you've ended up, you had such a, what I feel most people would describe as a sort of rocky teenage few years. I believe you had a kid at 16. Uh, so I wonder sort of how you went from that sort of place to becoming such one of the sort of world's leading experts in holistic health. Well, you know, the environment that I was in uh, as a child was, was our, our farm. So my parents left Los Angeles. So when I was probably about six, six or so years old, and then moved to Idaho where we had a pig farm for three years. Then from there, they uh, did the paperwork to immigrate to Canada but we stopped in Oregon and had a sheep farm for six months while my parents were selectively buying up rams that were known to produce black offspring because black wool is a kind of a rare commodity in the spinning and weaving trade. And, uh, uh oh, oh, sorry about that. I don't know what, what that was. Like Penny said, we've got a new brand new computer. So all sorts of switches and bells and whistles are <laughs> not like they used to be. Um, so while we were doing the paperwork, we were in or- Cottage Grove, Oregon and c- accumulating sheep. And we ultimately imported an entire cattle truck full of selectively chosen sheep to Vancouver Island. And my parents, uh, had a my father's still there uh, we have a 142 acre sheep farm on Vancouver Island and my mother's a yogi and my father has a degree in agriculture as well as being a builder and a, was a special effects man for Universal Studios so even though the environment was was very intense and and violent at times most times um, the way my parents farmed and the way we ate and the way we lived was really truly holistic. We ate almost everything off our own farm. We grew our own produce. We slaughtered our own animals. We made our own things like ice cream, milked our own cows, made our own cheese, made our own bread. Um, So my whole kind of connection to life came through living on a farm. And when you are on a farm, you don't really have the luxury of uh, doing stupid things that may not work because then you don't have any money coming in and you kill off your animals and your plants and everything else. And so my father was what's called a mixed farmer. He used a little bit of the commercial fertilizers, but he also used a lot of the organic principles together. And um, so I really got grounded in you know, how to take care of animals and, and all the things that, you know, you have to learn and being in the dirt all the time and working with machinery and having to fix things and build things and clearing land and building fences. And, you know, I did, because of that, I was exposed to a lot of trade work. So at an early age, I could weld, I understood engines. I went to school when I was 18 to, to trade school for auto industri- automotive and industrial repair and got my certification so I could technically work as a mechanic or things, you know, something like that or various things. I, wor- I learned hydraulic systems, electronic systems. So I got a, a grounding in, um, you know, basic trades work and did a myriad of other jobs in my life, which all those skills were helpful. And I also learned lots of skills. 
So by the time I became the trainer of the Army boxing team, I already what well, I was an athlete my whole life as a child moving forward. And I always noticed that guys that lived in the city and ate a lot of junk just didn't perform very well compared to the guys that in my neighborhood, we were all farm boys and we were all ass kickers. So as I matured and grew, I tested all sorts of different so-called scientific approaches and approaches of the day, be it training or nutrition. But inevitably, I found out they didn't work near as good as what I was doing on the farm and just the basic concepts that I'd learned from studying the old weightlifting magazines and some of the older bodybuilding magazines. So I really just sort of kept that holistic mindset while I was testing everything else. And my measuring rod was either myself or my clients because I was working as a therapist. And I was also training a lot of athletes, world-class athletes. And so I had feedback all the time. I could see with the boxers, for example, there was a direct correlation between how they ate and how well they performed. And it was easy to see. And the guys that ate a lot of junk food had a hard time fighting hard for three rounds. The guys that didn't could fight all the way. And so, um, you know, the coaches and the athletes on the boxing team before I became the trainer, I also represented the army in triathlon. I was, I won the army triathlon and then I represented the army at the national championships uh, in Hilton Head, South Carolina in 86. So it was a bit baffling for the fighters and the coaches because we trained on the boxing team sometimes six to seven hours a day, but I was also doing my own running, my own swimming and my own cycling on top of what I was doing as a fighter. And these guys, by the end of their training day, were just completely, utterly useless. They were so exhausted. And it was hard training for sure, but I stuck to the principles that I had learned. And, you know, I was a boxer starting when I was 12. So I learned what I had to do to get my body weight down for fights. At that time, my natural walking around weight was about 164 to 168, but I fought at 147. So I had to come way down and I didn't have <laughs> any extra body fat on me. So I developed my own approach it took me about three months to slowly bring my weight down but a lot of these guys were just doing crash dieting and putting on full sweat suits and skipping rope in the sauna at full heat and you know just a lot of stuff so they'd make weight by really stressing the system and the next thing you know they're fighting in a tournament and they're they got no energy and they're you know in our our boxing team was the third ranked boxing team in the world. So we weren't just fighting the local yokels. We were fighting Russia and Cuba and Africa and, uh, you know, the countries with the baddest fighters there are out there in the amateur boxing world. So um, you pretty much had to be on your game or somebody was going to knock your shit out. <laughs> Period. <laughs> you know, guys like Russians that grow up in a, communist environment the only way they can get free and make money is to be a good athlete so they're very very hungry and they train really hard and they're trained very hard so their capacity for pain and for work is something most americans can't even conceive so if you get in a ring with somebody like that and you're not on your game someone you know the audience is going to see your shoe size in no time yeah, you've certainly been a self-experimentalist. I've personally been uh, quite amazed, really. I mean, falling off from your work, listening to your podcasts. I would love to know, um, you mentioned this sort of life which you lived on the farm. In terms of modern life, you mentioned the sort of city living, the junk food. I would love to know what your, so what your thoughts are on modern life, how this potentially may be hindering health. What do you think are some of the most damaging effects 
of modern life on our overall health? What are some of the things people are doing wrong today? <laughs> well, have you got 10 hours? <laughs> <laughs> as long as you want to give me. <laughs> um, well, there's that's a big question. I'll kind of summarize it as best I can. So the way to do that is to look at my four doctor model, right? Mm -hmm. So basically what I found is that you cannot reduce life to a point of reduction more than those four doctors. So scientifically speaking, that would be called a reductio ad absurdum. A reductio ad absurdum means if you reduce something down any further than that, it loses meaning or context. For example, you can reduce water to H2O. But if you take the uh, any of those chemicals, the hydrogen or the oxygen apart, you don't have water anymore. Mm. It won't be wet. You can't drink it. You'll just have molecules. So you can't reduce water below H2O. You can't reduce the human life and what it takes to live a healthy life below Dr. Happiness, your mind, Dr. Diet, what you eat, Dr. Movement, how you move, and Dr. Quiet, how you rest. Those doctors are functional at the physical, emotional, and mental levels. So you have to address those four doctors from the perspective of what is happy making for you physically, emotionally, and mentally. You have to be conscious of how you move your body to keep it fit enough to deal with the forces of gravity and the environment for baseline health. And you have to be conscious of how you move your body in order to train for any athletic event or to have enough fitness uh, for your de de demands of your job. Like a policeman or a fireman, for example, has to have a much higher level of conditioning than someone that works as a lawyer or a doctor, okay? But you also have to be aware of how your emotions move through you and the movement of your mind, because if you're not aware of that, those things can be very problematic. You have to be aware that your physical body feeds on food. Your emotional body feeds on emotions and your mental body feeds on thoughts. If you put junk food in your body, it gets unhealthy. If you put yourself in an environment or you do things to yourself such as get trapped in drugs or addictions or with the wrong people, then you're feeding on negative emotions all the time and it will have a negative effect on your mind and your body. If you're not using your mind constructively to grow it and to learn how to think holistically and constructively and critically, then you just become a programmed robot which is what we have in the majority of people out there. They don't know how to think because school doesn't teach you how to think. It teaches you what to think. I couldn't get my questions answered in school. So after the ninth grade, I just said, why bother? Because the teachers can't ask, answer my questions. And neither could that it was the same thing when I was going to a Christian church. I got in trouble for asking questions that to me as an eight-year-old were important because I couldn't make sense of what I was being told without those questions answered. And I just got pushed aside. You have to rest your physical body. You have to know when to disconnect yourself from emotional entanglements or people that are emotionally painful. And you have to know how to rest your mind, which is why we now know that mindfulness and meditation are so critical, which has been known in the Eastern philosophies and religions for thousands and thousands of years. In our culture, the more you work your mind, usually the more esteemed you are, but you become, become a very out of balance person who maybe is very successful, but very dysfunctional. Mm. Okay, so think of people like Steve Jobs, for example. Uh, and many others. With Dr. Quiet, you also have to not only know about 
rest from getting enough rest to just keep your body healthy, which for the average person is eight hours a night. But you have to know how to use the principle of rest with regard to physical stressors, such as if you're a physical laborer and you're trying to work two jobs because maybe you've got yourself in financial debt and you're doing, you know, twice as much labor as your body can handle, then you're going to burn out like an athlete that's overtraining. If you're an athlete, you have to know the science of rest because um, more is not usually better in a lot of instances. And, you know, no pain, no gain just leads to a ruined athlete. So with Dr. Quiet, it's also the domain of introspection, looking within yourself. Why do I feel this way? Why do I get angry when someone says certain things to me? Um, why do I have judgments against people with other skin colors when they're just human beings like I am? Why did I uh, act the way I did even though I knew when I was doing it, it was going to cause me problems or end my relationship with my girlfriend or my boyfriend or get me in trouble in school or get me fired from my job. That's introspection, looking in. And that is also the domain of self-reflection, witnessing your own thoughts, your own beliefs and your own behaviors and asking, is it getting me where I want to go? Am I becoming somebody that I enjoy being with and being period? Yeah. Okay. So if you take that simple context, now there's much more to the model that could get more comprehensive than listeners might be ready for because it, it's, it's actually the basis of, of alchemy. So for example, Dr. Happiness relates to the air element, which relates to the season's spring. Dr. Movement relates to the fire element, which relates to the season summer. Dr. Diet relates to the earth element, relates to the season fall. And Dr. Quiet relates to the water element, which relates to winter. So if you look at a day, you begin your day, it's the springtime of the day. And if you don't wake up knowing what you're going to do, then you're probably going to be pretty useless throughout the day. So there you have to, spring relates to planning. Midday is when the sun's at the height. It's when it's the hottest. There's the most light and the most energy in the environment. That represents summer. And then afternoon, late afternoon as the sun's going down represents fall. And that's when you're supposed to celebrate, okay? But what are you supposed to celebrate? That you'd got something done. So what do we have now? A bunch of people smoking tons of pot, staring at screens. The average 20 year old is like 7.9 hours a day looking at their phones and screens and playing video games. So you gotta say, well, who's paying them to work and what are they getting done if they're on their phones nine, uh, almost eight hours a day? So the point I'm making is if we follow the alchemy of life, we get up in the morning, we eat, we're active, we get something done, we come home in the evening and then we celebrate. Then we smoke a joint and say, I can reward myself for getting something done. I can enjoy some food because I've exercised and, and cared for my body and so I can feed it and I can even enjoy a little dessert because I have got the metabolism to turn it into flesh instead of fat. Then we can go to bed knowing that we've had a successful day and our body's tired because we've used it effectively, not because we've abused it. Okay, so with that context, start with Dr. Happiness. Not long ago, I saw a lecture by Arnold Schwarzenegger where he quoted statistics from Europe and the United States. In Europe, they found that 70, I believe it was 70% of people when surveyed said they hated their job. In the United States, it was 75% of people said they hated their job. Well, let me ask you a question. What would your life be like if you went to a job every day that you hated? Oh, good. It would be miserable. It would be miserable. 
So you'd be in a dimension of reality that you don't really want to be in. So what do you think most people do to get out of that dimension of reality? They turn to drugs, alcohol, pornography, escapism. You got it. Okay. And so then the deeper question is, why are they doing things they don't want to do? Because they're convinced that's what they've got to do for money. And they've been raised by parents that told them, oh, you shouldn't make music. You'll never make a living. You need to go to school and get this degree or do that. And teachers did the same thing to them. So as children, we all have an innate sense of what makes us happy and makes us feel good. But our parents and the adults talk us out of it because they want us to be just as miserable as them. Now, they don't realize that's the reason, but they think they're trying to help us be successful. Well, how do you be successful in a world full of unhealthy, unhappy, overweight, sick, unfit, dull people that read religious books and believe them without even questioning it? and then hold these religious ideologies over each other, but can't practice them and don't practice them. So what you end up having is, is a bunch of people that were brainwashed by corporations, including corporate religion, to be good little cogs on a wheel, not ask questions, not be creative, not think for themselves, and just followed the orders given so they become passive unproductive, uncreative people that basically end up having to spend tons of money to try to figure out how to make their life interesting and enjoyable, get caught in addictions, end up with credit card bills through the roof. And research shows that 98% of the US population is one paycheck or two paychecks from bankruptcy. And it's about the same in England and most places of the world where, that are industrialized. So we're in a corporate environment where um, consumerism is the myth of the day. If you don't feel good, buy something. If you don't feel good, take a pill. All of those externalize our responsibility for our internal domain onto some object or some doctor or some external factor, all of which makes you highly profitable. And Bill Gates is probably the most successful at harvesting human souls by entrapping them with technology. And he's got friends out there that do the same thing. <laughs> All you gotta do is watch the uh, documentary on Netflix called Social Dilemma, and it'll let you see the inner workings of how people's minds are being scientifically addicted to things that are not healthy for them and ultimately destroy their relationship with themselves, others, and destroy the fabric of culture but that's very profitable so it keeps happening and most people are too passive to enter to interject and say that's enough video games that's enough of this because i'm not achieving my goals in life so they just get caught on a treadmill uh research by michael mogadun a, a man with a master's degree in public health showed only eight percent of women of 8% of men and 3% of women worldwide do any regular exercise, including walking a dog. Wow. So when you go to the gym and you see people riding their bikes on the street now and then and kicking soccer balls, you're seeing everybody that's actually exercising, <laughs> right? I tell people, look, San Diego is a city with 3 million people. You see a lot of bicycle players, golfers, and tennis players, and people surfing. But what you don't realize, you're seeing everybody out of the three million that's exercising. The rest of them are just sedentary people eating junk food, watching junk, and believing junk, and not questioning it, which is one of the reasons we're having the big problem we're having with this whole COVID issue right now, because people are actually gullible enough to believe what's in front of them without realizing it's all make-believe and it's highly profitable and they're losing their freedoms and they're losing their health and they're getting sicker and more violent and they're acting like animals caught in a cage because they're not smart enough to realize there's no door on the cage. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just believing whatever someone puts in front of them without doing any research or thinking about it. 
And so they do the same thing with their bodies. Instead of trying holistic approaches or changing their diet or exercising or learning to breathe properly or sleeping, they go have organs cut out and glands cut out and get stuck on toxic, dangerous medical drugs, which goes completely against the Hippocratic Oath, which says first do no harm, right? Then you look at the, if you look at the book, The Human Zoo by Desmond Morris, Desmond Morris did research to clearly identify what happens to animals when they're put in zoos. What happens to their physiology, their relationships, their health. And he showed that when you put animals in zoos, the quarters are so confined, they can't move naturally. They can't be the animal that they are. So they get sick and they have high levels of stress and they start having health problems and they break down. But then he correlated the findings of his research on animals and he showed exactly the same thing happens to people when they live in cities. Right down the line. And our bodies are animal bodies. So when you look first at it, in my system, I have a four step system, which is one, what is your dream goal or objective? What do you love enough to make better decisions to grow for and to become something for? I quote Jerry Wesh, the psychologist who said, if you have a big enough dream, you don't need a crisis, which is very, very true. But most people have talked themselves out of their dream. So they just are, uh, shall we say, conditioned to be in crisis mode all the time, which makes them profitable. So if you don't have a clear idea of your dream goal or objective, then how do you organize your day? How do you organize um, your learning objectives? How do you organize what's important and meaningful versus what's unimportant and not meaningful? How do you know when to say no to drugs, alcohol, or being lazy or any of these other things? Because you have no, you have no connection to values that are essential to support your objective, which is meaning making, okay? So if you don't have a clear dream and values around what is happy making for you and how you have to care for your body and how you have to feed your body for your individual needs and how you have to rest your body, well, then you don't have any uh, way to discern what is or isn't contributing to your health, your life, your growth, and your own um, development. So you just become a target for corporations to suck the life right out of you. And you spend tons of time looking at video games, watching pornography and watching junk television, getting your mind program to live at the level of the average or worse. And as Jung said, the average man can never be successful because by definition, they're average. Um, <laughs> but the reality of it is, is I believe every human being is a genius. And their heart is the compass that guides them to knowing what it is that is natural as a means of expressing that genius, right? If you love music, then you're likely to find your genius making music. But if you love exercise, you're likely to find your genius doing that. But if you love exercise and I put you in a cubicle and give you a job as an engineer and you just look at plans all day and electrical circuits and where a switch is gonna go, you might make a lot of money that you'll end up spending on doctors and therapists because you got a high blood pressure, heart disease, and your sex organs stop working. Okay. So then when you look at how people eat, people shop for food like they shop for gasoline or, or clothes or shoes. They, they don't realize that there's no such thing as good, cheap food. Because the way you make cheap food is you farm it in mass, which means the use of chemicals, the destruction of the soil, and or you're buying food that's so highly processed that a lot of it's not even real food anymore. So you're feeding a body something that cannot sustain life in a body. And it actually costs more to run most of what people eat from mouth to anus than it delivers in energy and nutrition. 
So as they're eating and eating and eating, they're actually depleting their enzymes and depleting the nutritional resources because that's what the body has to do to try to get something out of the food. A simple analogy would be as if you're washing a bunch of very dirty soiled clothes, because maybe you're a mechanic, you're gonna to have to put a lot more laundry soap in there than, than, than some lady who works as a secretary and she's just washing her normal work clothes. Well, the analogy is those dirty clothes are junk food. So you gotta put a lot more energy and resources into breaking junk down just to try to find something the body can use than you do when you eat an organic uh, carrot, apple, tomato, potato, vegetable, animal, because the, enzymes are there and the nutrition's already there. So the body doesn't have to burn itself out chasing uh, some tiny little molecule that's already denatured and oxidized and dead anyhow. And so typically by the time people are about 32 to 35 years of age, they're already enzyme deficient and every single biochemical reaction in your body requires enzymatic interaction. So if you're enzyme deficient and you're nutrition deficient, basically you're screwed. And once again, you're a target for all sorts of drug companies and doctors, and you'll have all sorts of health problems. And you'll be taking a bunch of pills that will further make your body toxic and which will numb your pain. So you have no motivation to manage it and do something with it. And so you basically become um, somebody who's like a walking dead person which is profitable because you then you're also in a state where you cannot think for yourself because you don't have enough energy to think. Thinking takes a lot of energy. The brain is 1 20th of your body weight on average and it uses 80% of the available blood sugar anytime you're cognitively engaged. So comparatively speaking, your brain is a huge, huge vacuum for, for energy compared to your musculoskeletal system. It's like a very powerful computer that draws a lot of energy off the body, but it runs on carbohydrate or sugar. And so this is why when people leave tests in school, for example, even after a couple hours, they feel completely exhausted because their brain's working their whole body. So when people do have jobs that require the use of their brain, which could be any technical job, and they're not taking care of their body, they actually exhaust their body with their brain and because they don't know how to eat or take care of themselves or breathe or cultivate energy through Tai Chi, Qi, Gong, yoga, et cetera, the way they compensate is they drink coffee, tea, soda pop, eat sugar, smoke cigarettes, and further decrease their nutrition, further acidif acidify their body. Uh, and basically what happens is they get to the point where they're um, – a perfect petri dish for diseases like cancer. And then they cut them some more and give them some more junk and they take them to the hospital and feed them Cheerios, cornflakes and crap and call that medicine. So there's a quick summary as to why people are the way they are. <laughs> Man, there was some really profound stuff in there. And for these people listening now, um, they... I definitely am going to link people to your four doctors book because there is some great stuff in there at a very practical level. So practical exercises, you mentioned yoga and whatnot. It could be meditation. It could be a movement exercise, could be a specific meal. Could you offer us perhaps three practical things or practices that we can start today that would improve? Could be any one of the four doctors. Do you have three practices which you found to be particularly effective? Well, yeah, that's pretty easy. I mean, if you want to go by doctor, for doctor happiness, just get clear about what is happy making for you and make time to do it every day. Because if you're not making happiness, then you're making unhappiness, <laughs> period. Yeah, very true. <laughs> for doctor movement, the best exercise in the world is the one you're willing to do every day. So quite simply, walking is very easy to do. Most of us can do it, and it doesn't require any equipment 
in general, other than clothes and a pair of shoes, I don't even wear shoes around here because I got a beautiful piece of property, but um, one need not go past walking. There's no sense giving a bunch of elaborate exercises because if they're not going to do the walking, they're sure as hell not going to do the fancy stuff. But a simple exercise is just for those that are sedentary, instead of giving them squats, I say, okay, well, all you got to do is just stand next to a chair and lower yourself slowly till your butt touches the chair as you're exhaling and then stand up as you're inhaling and time your breathing to the movement. And when you get strong enough, just take the chair out and squat down till you hit the bottom or as far as you can comfortably go and then inhale as you're going up so that right when you finish the standing up, you finished your inhalation. As you're going down, time the exhalation so that you finish your exhalation right when you hit the bottom of the squat. If people would just do that very simple exercise, ideally 20 minutes a day, but any minutes helps. Even 10 minutes or even five minutes can make a huge difference for somebody. I would encourage people to build up to at least 20 minutes and that's called a breathing squat. That's right out of my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. And that's something that anybody can do, right? Then with Dr. Diet, just remember if the food's more dead than you are, it's going to take life out of you. The longer it lasts on the shelf, the worse it is for you because they have to kill all the enzymes to make stuff last on the shelf. And the more nutrition they take out of it, the less likely it is to rot. So you ultimately end up eating something that's not even food anymore. So some of my rules are the longer it lasts on the shelf, the worse it is for you. If it wasn't here 10,000 years ago, you probably shouldn't eat it. If you can't pronounce a word on the label, your liver sure as hell ain't going to like it. <laughs> if it's not organically farmed, it's toxic as hell and it'll poison your body. And you're also contributing to the destruction of the planet by spending money on commercially farmed foods. Then when he gets to Dr. Quiet, quit bullshitting yourself and drinking coffee and stimulating yourself. Try to live as close to the balance of the sun. In other words, get to bed by 1030 at the latest or you're gonna disrupt your hormonal cycle because our whole hormonal system is driven by the sun and rise with the sun and give yourself eight hours of sleep and stop using all the stimulants to compensate for lack of sleep because sleep's probably the cheapest, most powerful form of healing and medicine there is in the world. And it's free. And if you're having a hard time getting enough sleep at night, then take naps. The best time to take naps are 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. because the body has a natural dip in its energy cycles at that time of day. But if you're gonna take naps, it's generally not good to go longer than 20 minutes or you'll go into a hibernation state and you'll have a hard time waking up and you'll have to drink coffee and all that kind of stuff to get yourself back up into consciousness again. So a short uh, nap, like a 20 minute nap has a huge amount of regenerative power. And it makes the brain function much better and the body feel much better. Um, swimming is something that almost anybody can do no matter how obese or out of shape they are because you're buoyant and it decompresses the joints. Taking cold showers stimulates the autonomic nervous system, strengthens the arteriovascular tree so it strengthens you in internally. And you, you could start just putting your hand in there. But ideally, I like people to build up to six to 10 minutes or until their body goes numb and that has a huge benefit because when the cold water hits your skin, it activates the sympathetic system, which pushes blood to the surface to try to warm you. But once your skin starts to go numb, the arteries close down and push all the blood towards the organs and glands, which is called the hunter's reflex, to keep you so that your uh, key organs and glands and brain won't die. Because in nature, if you fell through the ice, it was okay if you got frostbite and lost a hand, a foot or a toe or something like that. But if you lose 
your kidneys or your liver or something, you know, serious like that, you're dead. But when you actually get yourself cold enough that the surface of your body goes numb, you've now taken your arteriovascular tree through a cycle. First, the sympathetic pushes it to the surface. Then you go parasympathetic and it pushes it into the core. But what people forget is your whole arteriovascular system is loaded with muscles, particularly the arterial system. And because we live inside these containers that are pretty consistently around 70 to 73 degrees, the internal systems never get any exercise. So people get weaker and weaker inside their bodies. And even athletes, loads of athletes are so-called stronger fit, but they can't handle a minute of exposure to cold water without just turning into babies and crying and saying how terrible it is because they're internally weak. So even within the fitness community, we now have what I call a bunch of fit sick people. They basically have expended their nutrition to make their external body look good or what they see in the mirror at the expense of the internal systems, which is a really bad investment because to do that, you got to take the energy and resources that your organs and glands need to keep you alive and push it up to the surface of the body to make muscle, which is not something the body wants to do, which is why they have to keep using stimulants and drugs, a lot of them, to keep exercising because the body's trying to avoid it by making them tired or making them ache. Um, another great exercise is just to Take at least five minutes a day, but really up to an hour is more ideal. And simply just witness the thoughts running through your head and just watch it like you're watching a movie. And most people's heads is, is far more wild and scary than the television shows people watch. So by doing that, you disconnect yourself from the thought process and the emotion process and become an observer. You can control something that you can see. You can control something that you can make into an object. But if you don't have the awareness that you are not that thought or that feeling, then you are actually entangled with it. So this is why people say things like, I don't know why I said that to person. I don't know why I punched that guy. Because they're entangled with their unconscious repressed emotions, fears, judgments, and biases, and they don't realize that they're actually like a puppet on strings being controlled by their programming. So they act just like their mother, which drives them nuts, but they don't realize they do it to everybody else. And they act just like their dad, maybe having a short temper and criticismal and judging other people. And they don't realize they're doing it because it's unconscious. But once you start just witnessing your thoughts, feelings, emotions, and even reviewing your day and witnessing your own behavior, like replaying the tape in your head of your argument with your girlfriend or your boss or your friend and saying, well, what, what, what was it that they were really trying to save me? What was it that was upsetting them? What did I do that I didn't realize I did? Then what happens is what's unconscious and subjective, the instant you identify it, you can name it. You can say, ah, there's my tendency to act like my dad when I'm talking to women, which hasn't worked well for him. <laughs> then you can blame it. Every time I behave like my father, my relationships don't go very well, and I'm lonely because of it. Then you can tame it. Now that I know what it looks like when my dad's showing up inside of me in less than his best, I can be aware that the negative parts of my father are acting themselves out in me and I can step back and say, thank you, dear pain teacher, for showing me where I have a mind virus. My dream is to have great relationships with women and support them and be supported by them. Then you take the thought like this woman's a bitch that doesn't do what I ask her to do and flip it over and say, She's smart enough to do what she needs to do to feel good, and I can learn to do the same. So now you've taken what was subjective, unconscious, and controlling you, and by witnessing and naming it, you put it from the subjective inner realm 
of it controlling you into the objective realm where now you can identify it and recognize it when the tendencies start to emerge. Because you've now put a label on it and you can see it and you know its characteristics, you can tame it. It's like a wild dog that you tame. And it can take a little practice and commitment, but your life will get better every step you go and you blame it. Whenever my dad shows up, I feel angry or I feel disconnected or I uh, don't get as much sex because <laughs> I'm a dickhead. Okay. And so what you find with that simple practice that you just do in any place you can stand, sit or lie down, which is pretty much anywhere. And if all you can do is five minutes of it, then that's five minutes of quality time where you're learning to use your mind effectively and learning to manage yourself effectively. And eventually, guess what happens? You become an adult. An adult is, is someone who says what they mean and means what they say. An adult is someone who holds up their commitments and relationships and fulfills their responsibilities. My last question for you today, and then please sign off, is what makes a life worth living? Love. Love is the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassionate connection to self or other. Love is consciousness becoming aware of itself. Love is the binding force, the bonding force of the entire universe. So my question to you is, does it matter how much money you have or how much material goods you have or how much so-called success you have if you have no love in your life? I take love every time, man. Because without love, life is meaningless. Without love, there's no meaning to relationship. Without love, you're in total isolation. Without love, you're nothing but an object. And the real issue is, is we've been convinced to fall in love with things that people buy instead of each other. I walk through airports and see husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends sitting next to each other, communicating by text instead of looking each other in the eyes and talking to each other. The research shows that since the advent of social media, we've got far more anxiety and depression at every level from the elderly all the way to the children. We're losing the ability to use our brains from technology. People cannot tell what time it is using an analog clock, a normal hand clock. They can only read a digital clock. Kids don't know how to do math with a pencil. They don't know what direction north, south, east, or west is. Jamie Oliver, the famous British chef, did research in elementary schools all over the world where he showed them flashcards that were a mix of corporate symbols and common fruits, vegetables, and farm animals, and showed that 50% of school children could not recognize common fruits, vegetables, and farm animals, but they were able to identify 100% of corporate symbols. <laughs> These are the people that are gonna have to clean up the mess that we've created through our ignorance and our greed and our being distracted by high technology. Connect with you, Paul. How can people listen? Yeah. yeah, how can people listening right now connect with you and your work? And if there's anything you wanna tell them about, any projects? Well, the best thing to do is just go to the Institute's website chekinstitute.com, our social media site where we have a lot of free education, audio, video, etc. articles is chekiva.com, C-H-E-K-I-V-A.com. My YouTube channel, which has over 550 videos people can watch for free is youtube.com forward slash Paul, C-H-E-K live. That's enough to keep people going for a long time <laughs> i will link them to it below man paul i can't thank you enough for coming on the show i love speaking to you uh, there was so much gold in you today i really really appreciated your time yes also my book how to eat move and be healthy which i suspect you're familiar with has all the basics everybody needs to know it shows you how to 
it takes you through an assessment so you know what systems in your body need help and shows you what to do about it. And then our holistic lifestyle coaching level one program, which is for the public to teach them how to use the principles in the book and more in a series of short online lessons that anyone can do from around the world is available through checkinstitute.com. So I've spent my whole life, 36 years, almost as of January, it'll be 37 years I've devoted to producing education on all aspects of holistic health, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. There's enough information out there that anybody that wants to get themselves healthy can do it. And the fastest way to make sure you're changing the world is to start with yourself because humanity is a collection of cells called individuals and waiting for other people to change isn't going to help. But the instant that you take better care of yourself and start putting money in the hands of corporations that are taking care of the soil and the planet by buying organic food and working with sustainable corporations, then you're already changing the world. And if we all just focused on that, we could make a huge difference in, in a very short period of time. I love it, man. Paul, thank you so much for coming on, sir. A real, real pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you.